it's the anil is very clever. It's you know fine. what? It's, it's fine. pretty clever as a as a as an idea, but it's even more clever as a business. The cheap thorium. <laughs> no, that's a, almost it uh, almost doesn't show up in the cost structure. Uranium is more per pound, and you need the vast about more in order to enrich it for the for the halu. In terms of the cost structure, the fuel, the thorium just dies away to nothing. So you That's do use right. HALU. But almost all the cost is in the HALU. Yes, uh, yes, which is exactly our model. All the cost is in the HALU. Right, because the thorium what is actually the bone. That's not the clever part. The clever part is that there's almost no capital raises required to get to a very profitable, like the capital efficiency of its company. We're both hobbled by the HALU. We both need the HALU because we both need a neutron source. Are you trying to talk to me while I'm setting up cameras? That's so cute. <laughs> Should we should we hide the alcohol, Mark? I don't know. No, no. It's it, I think it reveals to the audience what they should expect. The humanity. Yeah. The humanity. Well, I suppose. The humanity. The humanity of you having this plastic cup yeah. and me having this <laughs> dignified glass. Oh, stand by. Oh, stand by. I'm, I'm grabbing glass. My name is Dr. Stephen Boyd, a fluoride salt chemist. I'm a huge fan of anything that is fluoride salts. I did most of my PhD work in lanthanide doped fluoride salts, and then I've continued on my postdoctoral fellowship, continuously interested in uh, fluoride ionic conductivity. Salt belongs on the rim of margarita glasses, not in nuclear reactors. I proudly dropped out of my PhD. I'm Mark, and I think that the right place for fission products is in the fuel rod. I'm very interested in molten fluoride salts. You have basically a glorified trash can filled... Maybe not glorified. ...filled with a molten fluoride salt. The fuel is its own working fluid. You can get energy from material as it flows. I find that to be an interesting advantage. I find it to be an advantage to use reactors that already exist and are profitable. Just make them a bit more profitable and you've got a winning play. One of my favorite clients is CleanCore Thorium Energy. I'm a consultant. I work in industrial space and for NGOs. On one hand, I try to stop nuclear plants from closing. And on the other hand, I like to see nuclear plants get built. So I'm working in both of those two areas. I'm a fan of clean core thorium energy because what they're proposing is to take a bunch of technology that works really well and help it make extremely cheap nuclear energy. The way they propose to do this is to take natural uranium fuel for heavy water reactors and to replace the natural uranium in the fuel bundle with a mixture of thorium and halu, high assay, low enriched uranium. The idea being you can reduce the need for fueling operations and waste operations by a factor of seven. And for can-do reactors that are constantly having to refuel and take away waste, that's a significant operational advantage. And these reactors exist today and they can receive this fuel in a matter of years. I'm a fan of thorium as well. Both designs exploit the natural nature of thorium as a, shall we call it, a latent fuel. In my design, thorium is the blanket which surrounds the core. Both of our designs involve HALU. Both of our designs need neutrons, for which HALU is a wonderful source. Are neutrons scarce, Stephen? Is there a run on neutrons neutron I need to know economy. about? There is a very strict neutron economy that comes from beginning with HALU, which is our neutron source, and then ending up with our thorium, which is our neutron sink. The blanket surrounds the core. The blanket is both enriching thorium into uranium, and it's an effective neutron reflector. So our neutron economy is actually extremely high. Now, Stephen, when you say there's a blanket of thorium, you make it sound so comforting. Would you put this blanket on a small child? I would sleep on top of my blanket, Mark. Mark, 
why aren't you doing what Steven's doing? And Steven, why aren't you doing what Mark's doing? Like, what's unappealing and stupid? Mark could be smart, but his idea could be stupid, and it could make you feel sick just hearing about it. No, there's nothing stupid about Mark's idea. I'm a bit of a hot rod, and he's kind of a Lincoln Cruiser. If only hot rods hadn't been invented yet, and Lincoln Cruisers were already in service. The can-do physics has been around for quite a long time. Longer and proven in comparison to the molten salt reactor. The contrast is I'm interested in extremely high fuel efficiency with very little waste. On a 30 megawatt electric, so 120 megawatt thermal, we can make for every one year of operation, four years of fuel. And the MSR design that we have so slavishly, unapologetically stolen from Oak Ridge National Laboratories was a design that was perfected in 1959. When you can steal something like that, sometimes it's not because you're a good thief, sometimes it's because it was scarcely worth protecting. Oak Ridge National Laboratory scientists, they had already run the experiments. You're proposing something that was uh, known but not valuable enough to repeat. And I'm proposing something that for quirks of history just wasn't attempted yet. Anything and everything that comes off that molten salt reactor is going to make me money. You want them to make you money even if people won't pay you for them. Or if you spend more to get them than they're worth. Neptunium-237. My favorite. Something that is naturally produced from a thorium-uranium reactor. With a reactor that I have designed, which makes four reactors worth of fuel for every one reactor at 120 megawatt thermal, or which is equivalent to 30 megawatt electric. Stephen, do you have a sense for the percentage of the total cost of a nuclear power plant over its life cycle that's the fuel? In other words, of the levelized cost of electricity for megawatt hour of energy developed over the life of a nuclear plant, what percentage approximately is the actual fuel? And therefore, what is the potential savings of reducing that fuel cost? LCOE, levelized cost of electricity, which has, what Mark has just mentioned, is literally incomparable with other forms of electricity production. But not with other nuclear reactors. If you had a business, Stephen, that was struggling because of, let's say, macroeconomic conditions, and they're looking down their budget items and they're saying, paper towels in the bathroom, very cheap, but let's try to save a little. That's not going to save that company. My point here is that the genius of Thor and the genius of nuclear is that you need not much of the fuel and the fuel is fairly common. Meaning if you have a way to do a lot more novel engineering, risky engineering, not necessarily for the public, but for your business, you're doing new things with engineering. You don't know about the long life of your asset and you're doing it to save a little bit of paper towels. I appreciate your vision, but you surely appreciate that that's a bit of a risk. The physics and the chemistry are already known, Mark. With an MSR, I'm making my own fuel. Our terribly wasteful, supposedly, nuclear reactors that we have today that barely use any of the fuel, the portion of the total program cost that's the actual fuel is very small. In fact, you could argue that's the point of nuclear power in the first place. What that means is there's a bit of a asymptote aiming towards zero where if you save money on that fuel, the amount that you're saving is smaller and smaller and tinier and tinier percentages of your total program cost. And if you're working with the reactor type with very little operational experience and very little construction experience, it means that in order to ostensibly save on a part that's known and small, you're taking potentially large, unknown risks. Public perception. A portion of the human public, regardless of country, is very worried about nuclear waste. What happens with the nuclear waste in a liquid reactor? It effectively disappears.
And that's why I'm such a fan of a liquid reactor, is because not only does the liquid waste effectively disappear, right, because it's either burned primarily or recycled and burned secondarily. You have to say liberated or something. You can't say burn. You can't say burn. Do it again. Why can't I say burn? Objection. I'm siding with Stephen in this. <laughs> I, know, yeah. I know. You said that today in your presentation, Mark. You can't say burn. People, you can't, we are not going to say burn. burn. No. No burn. burn. There's no burning? Burned. 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 <laughs> People love <Burned>. combustion. <laughs> People love combustion People when it's love. in their own house and it's private and it's a campfire. Okay. And We've got this odd holiday in the United States. It's called July 4th where we burn everything. Yeah, and in the, in the UK, they've got Guy Fawkes Day where they... Burn. Oh, they've got Guy Fawkes Day. Yes, absolutely. Yes. We like fire. Humans like fire. Okay? But November 5th, right? November yeah. 5th is Guy Fawkes Day, right? <laughs> I, thought, I thought this was subtle. I thought everyone could be like on board with the, we're not going to say burn. Because it'll, it'll combustion. Everyone maybe, but not Stephen and Mark. Right. Burned is kind of an informal bit of lingo, bit of a grimace, right? With a with a bit of a wry smile. Is That's, that true, Mark? Is that true that it's with a wry smile? Because I didn't know that. I, I'm not a nuclear engineer, but I just I didn't know that it was like tongue in cheek or something like that. It's with a bourbon smile. <laughs> well, well said. Well said. Look, there's a number of cute phrases in nuclear science yeah. and engineering that come from those heady days back in the 1940s Absolutely. where in just a few academic terms, we went from discovering that fission existed to demonstrating it in a lab, to building yeah. nuclear chain reactions, to building giant production reactors, not of electricity, but you can't be too picky in wartime. And then finally, only a few years after that, a few budget cycles really, you had working nuclear reactors powering electric grids. It means that the words can come hot and heavy right. when you're working that fast and making that much progress. So you're, you're saying basically a nuclear poison as a term is okay because they were in a rush. That's it's not a real that's poison. That's marketing, Who's really gotten poison from it. Xenon? How about Barnes? Barnes is, is the most wonderful, dearest unit of measurement. A legitimate SI unit of measurement that was based on a joke. Uranium was found to have a very large cross section, so they said, wow, it's as big as a barn. Right, it's as big as a barn, but, right. Uh, anyway, if we can have barns, we can have burned, and we can have burned, we can have poisons. And look, nuclear energy, I think, is going to be more popular the more we embrace its quirks, not hiding from some feared public that's going to be offended by the use of technical terms. Yeah, but most, most Canadians actually think that nuclear power is high carbon. So it's like, I know that we might not have been informed, but when we hear you can burn uranium, it's like that's going to help put that subconsciously putting two and two together. People are into hydrogen now. They think we're going to burn it, and they think it's going to be low carbon. So I, I, look, it's, it's about winning people's heart on nuclear as a thing, and then they will independently realize or decide that it's clean. So for example, in France, until recently, the French thought that nuclear was high carbon. They also didn't like it. It's kind of an overlap. If you don't like it, you think it's bad. You know what's also bad? Carbon emissions. So you just lump all the bad things together. Once people decide to like nuclear, heck, they may attribute it with positive properties it doesn't even have, just because they like it now. That's where I think we're going. People are gonna either broadly like it or broadly dislike it, and they'll apply correct and incorrect good qualities to it if they like it, and correct and incorrect bad qualities to it if they don't like it. We're not gonna be able to change that, but we will be able to win the hearts and minds. <laughs> Even natural gas and coal companies don't say they burn their stuff for combustion. Like, they have websites that don't use language like that. Burn. It doesn't work, though. <laughs> It doesn't work. They're not going to convince anybody. Because, because ultimately, they are literally lighting fire and flame. And people know it. To use an, a, a, a colloquial term like burning is metaphorical. And I think it's metaphorical with a smirk, with a tongue-in-cheek for scientists people like Mark and me. People think the steam is smoke. People think the steam is smoke, Stephen. Oh. That's because they haven't learned to love like a good tobacco pipe, where smoke and steam are good.
Smart. Look at this douche. It's We're smart. ganging up on Gord. <laughs> uh, Humans are messy. Liquid reactors are messy. Most industrial chemicals on the planet today involve heat. For example, ammonia, the primary component of fertilizer, which is used throughout the entire planet. Particularly important today because Ukraine and Russia were one of the primary producers of ammonium-based fertilizers. That is a thermally intensive chemical process. It's roughly 400 degrees Celsius and molten salt reactors would exactly provide that level of thermal energy to drive those kinds of reactions. For example, right now, ammonia is so important that it consumes 2% of the world's total energy production per year. Molten salt reactors providing enormous amounts of process heat, roughly 650 degrees and up, would be an ideal source for the thermal energy required to drive the ammonia reaction. And I can give you several other examples of high temperature reactions that would require that level of process heat. If you're going to do high temperature work from reactors, there is a large engineering advantage in doing it not from hot gases, but from, from something with a higher heat capacity like uh, the hot salts. The area of your device where the heat is transferring at high temperatures can be uh, bigger physically in, in a molten salt reactor than in a gas reactor where the gases cool off very rapidly. It just makes a different engineering challenge. Yeah, Mark is absolutely correct. And he, despite not being a chemist, uh, he actually used the correct terminology, right? So the high specific heat of the molten salt liquid itself is an excellent heat transfer medium. And so that is an effective way to move the heat from one place to another place. And chemists and physicists and engineers call that a working fluid. That's the nice thing about a molten salt reactor is because the fuel can act as its own working fluid. Our reactors will be making electricity which can drive high temperature operations and we can do that and keep everything nice and warm for the 10 years while we're waiting for you to invent your system. I think you'll find that molten salt reactors don't offer anything at all, at least not that verb tense. They may offer conditionally on being created and working some features, which uh, can do boosted with thorium Haley fuel may not offer in the near term, but at least I can use the word offer in the very near term for a system that exists and is profitable and effective to date, we can just make it a bit better and that can happen in a matter of months. All molten salt reactors have been proven. Proven at what scale? 10 megawatts over roughly 12 10 months. megawatts, that's like a herd of horses. M-S-R-E, the molten salt reactor experiment. You know, we built a working prototype version of almost every damn possible reactor system under the sun. Even crazy exotic ones that people like to not think about, like remember organically moderated reactors. I do. Even as an inorganic chemist, you must loathe this organic moderated reactor. So complicated, so sludge-like. Anyway, but we've tried a very large number of reactors. Almost every time I see somebody say, I've got this new reactor idea, we've tried it and it just wasn't as good in operation as other reactors. You have a working fluid that has a high melting point. I'm going to stick with second generation Gen 4 reactors, Mark. I think it's a pretty safe bet. You know what I call generation 4 reactors that you're building at prototype scale for the first time? Tell me. I call them generation 1. I want to make money. None of these reactor systems are going to make you money unless the very products that evolve from the reactors themselves are of inherent value. Uh, can we just say that a good product from a reactor might be reliable electricity? 
Why would one base an economic model off of something that everybody wants the cheapest of? Base your business model on something that will maybe produce electricity, but will also produce necessary and valuable medical isotopes, isotopes for space exploration, such as Neptunium-237, as well as other enormously valuable isotopes, such as Einsteinium, Berkelium, and Californium, all of which can be derived from a molten salt reactor, and none of which can be derived from an anneal reactor. Wait, 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 wait. Is there value based on not having a lot of sources for them currently? Because if you're making them at the scale that you might in your reactor, you could tank the market immediately. Especially the local one, if these are very short-lived isotopes. Excellent point. There is a market for all of them. For example, in a 1991 paper, explored the very nature of supply and demand with respect to actual isotopes, both radioactive and stable isotopes. It turns out that the moment that you expand the supply for scarce resources such as these, because there are enormous applications in such a wide variety of fields, that the cost goes up. So in your imagination, let's say you were selling electricity for the reasonable cost of $60 a megawatt hour or something. Take your pick if you've already done these numbers that I'm asking for. How much of your revenue are you thinking is deriving from, you know, the main purpose of these reactors? Power. A paucity. A paucity. I am far more interested in hydrogen production. With a high temperature reactor, such as a molten salt reactor, I would be producing hydrogen in any number of ways. Hydrogen is no longer going to be thought of as a fuel, but thought of as a chemical, as a reagent in the direct reduction of iron, the direct reduction of thorium, the direct re reduction of titanium, as well as copper and even nickel. So using hydrogen as a direct result of the electrolysis of water and then using it subsequently as a reagent in the processing of those five materials, you're going to be making a lot more money. I view electricity as the cheapest and weakest commodity in terms of a business model. But that's just me. So I'm a chemist. In other words, in some ways, we're talking and planning past each other and almost disjoint purpose for these two proposals. That may be true because as a can-do, as a thoriated can-do reactor, you may be able to produce cheap electricity, but you're not able to produce cheap electricity at high temperature. Can't you make any uh, high temperature you want if you have enough electricity? Like, you can always turn electricity into high temperature, right? You can, you can but, it's a, but, it's but it's a derivative. If you start out inherently with high heat, your high heat is your primary. Percentages, percentages. Uh, at a, at a can-do reactor, maybe 32% of your energy, 33% of your energy is uh, left after converting to electricity. That electricity is very high-grade energy. That you may convert to heat. The argument that Stephen is making here is that if you take your original amount of energy instead of converting two-thirds of it to waste heat and one-third to useful electricity, instead you convert a lot more of that to direct useful work straight away, in which case you get some multiplier over the over the usage you would get from the electricity from the low temperature reactor. And Mark is correct. Not a big multiplier, a little bit. I don't 50, know. Maybe 100% at the maximum. I know the boiling point under pressure of water, Mark, and is a hell of a lot lower than the operational temperature of a molten salt reactor. So I don't know. You don't get all that for free either, though. And that's true but I am making money along the way. For us, because we were profitable first and we took everything. <laughs> the interesting part about a molten salt reactor is the versatility. So for example, in the 1959 design that we have slavishly stolen from Oak Ridge National Laboratories, what you notice in the geometry is around the top and into which we can insert whatever isotope we want. That, 
That's nothing. You know what's really flexible? Santa's sleigh. It can carry however many gifts, however far. In the top of our reactor, we can produce some very valuable isotopes. So let's assume Mark's model is correct, that we are merely going to produce electricity. And we're going to throw away all that process heat to do so. We still have the ability from our versatile design in order to produce various isotopes. The one isotope that I'm actually interested in, as well as Canada, as well as the European Space in Agency, is Neptunium-237. NASA and the ESA and the Canadian Space Agency all take Neptunium-237 and make Plutonium-238. Plutonium-238 is a wonderful and very short-lived alpha emitter with roughly an 87.7 year half-life. What does that mean? Boatloads of alpha particles coming off of it which is what the original, as well as current, RTG batteries are made of. All of the batteries that are on Mars right now are based on plutonium-238. I, I don't know, Stephen. I feel loads of alpha particles coming off of me right now in my proposal for near-term reasonable deployment of thorium plus halu and candus. We're not waiting for it. We're not trying to pull it forward where it's today. Yeah, agreed. It, it's at our fingertips. The can do the can do reactor is is unapologetically a tried and true proven method. We'll see how the thorium works out. If you love the can do reactor so much, Stephen, why don't you marry it? Jesus. Oh, because I'm a chemist. I know you I know you <laughs> and I'm not a physicist. Okay. So I'm so as a chemist the can-do reactor is inherently inefficient, right? Because you're stuck. You're stuck in the solid state. It, it creates fission products. What happens to these fission products, Boyd? Are they, are they not going to uh, react in some way with the vessel wall? Do we, do, are they just going to float around happily? In the molten salt and cotton. Gonna get trapped somewhere, accumulate a bit? No! Yeah, okay, I'm gonna harvest them for money. <laughs> you are gonna saturate and destroy an extremely tiny local market for very specific isotopes. That's my prediction. Oh, God. I know you said that it would make new markets and it would keep up the demand, but I, this idea that something that your reactor, which would make amounts of these isotopes far bigger than available amounts, would not significantly reduce the value of those isotopes. I find that too hard to believe. Xenon and add Krypton are some of the worst neutron poisons ever found in any nuclear system, regardless of whether it is a solid state system or a liquid system. They plague both solid and liquid nuclear systems. The advantage of the liquid is that those gases are gases. They can be easily liberated from a liquid system, whereas they are arrested or frozen inside a solid state. Good. Good until the fuel rods themselves expand <laughs> be due to the internal pressure of the gases that are trapped within a ceramic as dense as your coffee cup. I hear you, and yet it's worked so far. It's worked so far because you have seven times the waste of a liquid system in terms of the trapped waste within the solid fuel rods, which require boatloads of money regarding extra processing. So what's your waste form from your reactors? The waste form actually comes in both solids, liquids, and gases. Oh, that's ideal. Everyone says, well, the way to deal with nuclear waste is to make sure it's a gas. One of the primary off-gases of a molten salt reactor system is tritium. But isn't tritium just the nuclear cousin of hydrogen? To capture your tritium, all you do is bubble it through water. You make tritiated water a very, very stable form that captures the tritium and allows you to make money. Tritiated water, famously a moneymaker of Fukushima Daiichi. In a 
controlled environment with a molten salt reactor naturally burping off highly measured quantifiable amounts of tritium bubbling straight into a natural water scenario you have a stable mildly radioactive easily internationally transportable by the way form of tritium and how much does that tritium cost per kilo mark five million dollars per kilo ah what we need is a good commercial market in tritium one of the most controlled ingredients of fusion bombs but tritium is an already mature market worldwide Tritium is used as a tracer in biological research as well as in vivo research. Tritium is also used as a naturally radioactive form that is used in reticles, thousands and thousands of gun sites in weaponry worldwide. Austria, Germany, the United States, France, the Czech Republic, even Russia all produce reticles made of tritium, which basically glow in the dark and allow effective targeting. Am I a fan of death? Am I a fan of, of merchants of destruction? No, I am not. What I am saying is that I would rather make money for, from a mature market that already exists and is never gonna go away. Like electricity production. Five million dollars per kilo of tritium made, Mark. Electricity is nice. As long as somebody isn't making a lot of kilos of it with their reactor. Again, I think we're just gonna have to agree to disagree on that part. I agree. The, I the supply agree sensitivity. Agreed. I think we have to agree to disagree. I would rather save lives with tritium, radioisotopic tracer, in many forms of cancer research than piss it away into the atmosphere. But that's just me. I think nuclear power was generally seen as negative for decades. How come you don't see it as negative? I am the relatively small percentage of humanity, along with my colleague Mark here, who understands the science. We were encumbered as a species by a horrible period in human history that is the Cold War, that is the threat of nuclear as a weapon. When nuclear power can actually be used as a savior for this species. I disagree that our difference is that we know the science. There are many people with scientific backgrounds who I've met who just use that sophistication to attack nuclear. I would say that we, for whatever reason, got lucky enough to fall in love with it or to get over fears and become curious about it. And then we put the time in to use our scientific background to understand nuclear. So I would propose that it's the other way around. You took the effort to use your scientific mind on nuclear because you had an intuition that you liked it or you were interested in it. Not that you became a fan of it because you used science on it. Before I die, I would really like to have this come to fruition. Not only for my children, my three kids, Declan and Gavin and Fiona, but for their kids and their children's children long after I'm dead. I would really love to see an efficient use of nuclear power, not only for the present, but for the future. We're profitable first. We buy out all of your IP and you slave away for years. No ownership stake, maybe making it work, in which case the rewards go to us because we made money first. <laughs> I rest my case. <laughs>